Don't you quit. Let's give it up for our fathers today. Oh, so much goodness to unpack. I hope that today we can give some insights into Father's Day and how to be a godly parent, how to raise a family, um, how fathers today, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think that uh, fathers, what the explanation or the definition of a godly father, what that is in today's culture, I think it's it's, it's at times being debated, and I hope that today uh, we can share some clarity with what God says. Uh, we'll look at this verse, and this is going to be the theme that we wrap everything around. It says in Proverbs, to train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Um, and that word train up, it really is, is talking about aiming. So you can think about it like an archer drawing back that arrow and, and aiming at a target. And as parents, our goal is to aim them at the way that God would have them to live, to instill in them godly principles. And, and in today's culture, I think it's increasingly uh, more difficult. And uh, why that is exactly, I would probably need five Sundays to uh, break that down. But succinctly, I'll try to say it like this. Um, man... It's the friendship game versus the, the authority game. And a lot of times people believe today in today's culture like that you're trying to be your, your friend to your child. I think that friendship is developed. It certainly is a part of it. But there's going to be a period of, I would say, around seven years um, when they start middle school till they graduate high school that somewhere in that general vicinity, you are not going to be friends. That, that if you're friends with them, that means that they're winning. And if they're winning, that means that they are probably in the end losing. And that they will desire to have all this freedom. And the truth of the matter is they can't handle the freedom. Um, and that they will end up doing things. And so society pushes us into a, a framework um, and I'm going to rail against this for just a moment before I bring out my uh, two oldest sons. And, and we've told many stories over the years, and I'm always telling them from my perspective. And I thought it would be fun uh, for you guys to get to hear the other side of the coin. And, and in the midst of all that, maybe we could all find some morals and some lessons that we can learn from. But um, one of the things that I would like to, to kind of ask us, I, this is kind of in the vein of a couple of weeks ago, we... We kind of talked about thinking. Remember, guys, Do you guys remember when we talked about that, like how you think? Um, and I think that sometimes society um, is telling parents to a fault that you need to let your child, uh, you know, figure out. Figure it out. Figure out who they are. Figure out, you know, what their boundaries are and all these things. I'm going to tell you right now. I've never raised a girl, okay? Never raised a girl. But if I allowed my three boys to figure out where the boundaries are, they would all not be alive right now, and my house would get burned to the ground, okay? Because they, they will do things, like children will, will do things to explore not knowing the consequences of their actions. And so my goal is not to let my child, children experience failure at a, a cataclysmic level so that they can know not to do that, um, like the fork in the in the power outlet, you know, you know, you. I don't want them to experience 110 volts going through their body, so that they will know not to do that. I would rather spank their little hand as they move toward it with the fork and say, "That's not what we do." And then they learn through that reinforcement that when I reach for the outlet with a metal object, that that's not good for me. But they didn't have to experience the pain in order to learn that lesson. And if we're not careful, I think society is telling us more and more that you let your children decide the boundaries. And that's not what God's Word says, right? He says the onus is on the parents. The parents are to aim their children at the way that they should go. And, and I just want you to think about that. Like, how are you in general? What is your strategy for aiming your children? If you are a young person in here, I want you to start thinking about what are you aimed at? Are you aimed at living a God-focused life? 
that you can have a tremendous amount of fun, which will be illustrated in the stories today, without having regret when you do it God's way. That if you weren't raised in a godly household, that you have the opportunity to change that outcome in your future by the decisions that you make today. Um, and spoiler alerts, uh, I was not raised in a godly household. I was not raised with any God whatsoever. No Bible, no church, no example um, of godliness whatsoever. So like if, if I can create generational change in my family, it's not because I'm special. It's because I made a decision that I was going to parent God's way, that I was going to get married God's way. And so I'm encouraging you today to listen to the stories, be entertained, I think you will be, but also beneath the fabric of that story, I hope that you'll be hearing how I am aiming my children, how I've always been aiming my children in the way that they should go, and then the transition occurs as they become adults is that that voice has to become their own, so their faith has to be authentic. And if your faith isn't authentic, then it's going to be hard for them to draw upon your example. So today I hope you'll be challenged to be more authentic in your faith, to grow in God's way, to also use God's word as your litmus test for how you parent, but also how you make decisions. And so without further ado, uh, would you guys welcome to the stage Titus and Jordan Bourne. For those of you that are guests at our church, uh, Jordan is our oldest. He was born first, and Titus is our second child. We have a third, but he's an eighth grader. Eighth graders aren't allowed on the stage. That's just <laughs> the way it goes. Um, he's by far my nicest child, um, sweet soul. Uh, these two are not, and I tell him that all the time. Just please stay that way. Stay that way. When, when Titus, when you were younger, you actually were uh, nice. He used to be a, such an encourager. I'd be driving down the road, and he'd be like, Dad, you are such a good driver. You, and I was like, thank you, son. Thank you. Do you feel like I'm not encouraging anymore? Well, I'm just saying not like that. Oh, okay. It okay. was just like everything was so nice. Hey. Preach so good. Happy Father's Day. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. That was so encouraging. Um, so what you'll see is a dichotomy um, up here that uh, Jordan was a really logic-driven child um, and uh, really autonomous. Uh, and then uh, Titus was more passionate uh, child. And um, how I had to shape them, okay, was, was slightly different. Um, every child is different. And, and um, I was... Uh, I wouldn't say disappointed. Um, of course, that'd be a terrible word. That would be a bad uh, word to say. That'd be a bad word. But um, I want to throw it out there. The first thing we're going to talk about is that, uh, and this is going to hurt some parents in the room, uh, but uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. So when you, thinking of, when you are thinking about your children, all right, if you are thinking that they are angels, little baby, sweet baby angel, um, when in fact they're sinners, then your strategy is going to be all off, right? you got to start with the fact that there's a little sinner in there. I promise you. There's, and I don't care. Even my little sweet Silas, my youngest, he's, he's a sinner, okay? And I think that so many parents want to start off in like this nostalgic mode that my child is always going to be this angel baby that never does anything wrong. And you got to, no, that's like, you're like, you're already fooled in here. You got to start off with like, no, there's a little devil in there, right? And I got to figure out what kind of devil they are. And then I got to get them to Jesus and then shape their little personalities into what God wants. And uh, whenever Jordan was young, uh, I I uh, figured out, so like, by the way, my background's in psychology, uh, so, you know, the Skinner box and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, if you know psychology, you know what that means. But it's like, a, I would study them. So Carrie was, you know, morning person, I'm a night person, and so I was in sleep duty, uh, which every mom in here, don't you wish you had a night owl of a husband so he could be on sleep duty? Just please, an hour. Um, so I would study him, and I'd try to figure it out, and, you know, the whole swaddle method, like you wrap them up in a blanket, really tight and then you like hold them like really tight um, not too tight but you know just tight enough and 
they, it mimics the womb, and, and Jordan, he's like holding for about 20 seconds, 30 seconds, he'd be like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and I'd sing a little song, it was like, little baby Jordan, little baby Jordan, little baby Jordan, yep. Yep. he's my friend. So that was, that was my song, and it worked every time. And I thought, I'm a genius, I've cracked the code, and now... I'll write a book. And Titus came along, and not very long in, I was like, okay, all right. He's crying. It's nighttime. Carrie's asleep. I'll wrap him up, you know, put him in the hold. And, dude, I got a whole new world. <laughs> like, throw the head back, just screaming in my face. And I was like, okay, tighten it up a little bit, you know. He can still breathe. Um, <laughs> And I thought, I'll outlast him, you know. I could not outlast this child. I had to go get Carrie. And I'm like, I, this one's broken. Something's, <laughs> something's wrong. The hold is not working. And I had to figure out a whole oh. different strategy just to get him to go to sleep. And so um, just, just to let you know, like even at birth, what I'm saying is totally different people. And if one strategy worked for you with that first one, I promise you, it is more than likely not going to work on the second. And God help the people that chose five, six. I don't know. I, I, I'd run out of ideas uh, by the time that gets there. And so I hope that you could see in their stories that they're going to share that they were shaped differently, but we're playing with the same rule book, but we're just applying it slightly different. Did you ever need any shaping, do you feel like? You know, every now and then, I'll never forget um, in, the, in the time before my middle school adolescent years, um, dad likes to call those the jack wagon years for all of our teenagers. Prime jack wagon years. Prime jack wagon years. I remember we were coming home from something, riding in the truck, and you never know what's going to go down in truck conversation on the way home. But truck time. Truck time with Tim. And <laughs> Sounds like triple, a podcast. Triple T. Um, we're getting off topic. He said, Jordan, for the next few years, we are not going to be on the same team. But then after that, we will be again. And I remember being a little bit confused. Like, I don't feel like we're not on the same team here. But you learn that when you get just uh, a little bit further in the world, you start wanting to go places. You start wanting to have things that you don't get to have. Everybody else gets to have. And um, one of those uh, situations in our house was always the phone rules. And so in our household, all the boys' bedrooms are upstairs, master and the communal area is downstairs. And that's where phones and devices were allowed. So we could not have cell phones, electronics upstairs in our rooms. And I always just wanted to talk to my friends or, you know, watch a movie, whatever it is. And so any of you who grew up with iPhones, you won't have a story like this. I grew up with an Android. And if you ever mess with an Android... As an Android shot, I'm the only Android user in my family. Left. Because I prefer freedom, America. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I why we have a family iPhone group slaves. meeting, not a family group chat. Oh. So. <laughs> we don't like green text messages. FaceTime. Okay? Oh. So this phone had dropped and been in whatever, how many situations, and the screen had gotten all messed up, and so... The only part of it that worked was this tiny little sliver on the bottom where I could see the bottom row of applications. And so I told my dad, you know, functionally, this phone is really just more like an MP3 player now, which I was allowed to have upstairs. Like, because I can just play my music app. It's right there. And I can press play. See? Can I have this? Which was true. And he said, you know, okay. So that was what it was. And then I discovered a few weeks later, if I pressed on just the right spot of the phone screen, it would come back to life. Like nothing had ever happened. And so I went down this wormhole. I got all the apps I wanted. I got all the Netflix and everything just up there with my phone, my second phone. I had to create a new Gmail account so none of it could get tracked back to my other phone. And I got so cocky with this. Oh, he was, he was next level. Crazy. Sinner. <laughs> you sinner. No. And so uh, one day... We were sitting around, standing around the pool table. We were playing a game of pool, and I had this thing in my pocket, and I had set it down on the glass table that was nearby while I was taking a shot, and um, did a little bzz, bzz, little notification, 
And he looked at me, and he looked over, and I looked at him, playing it cool. <laughs> hey, what was that over there? I, I don't know. I don't know what that was. Do you mind if I go take a look at it? No? No? Go ahead. And he walks over, and he picks it up, and he just looked at me. And I knew, somehow you already knew before you even walked over there. Somehow you knew. Before the game started, he knew. Just setting me up. So if you have Wi-Fi and you know how to get into your admin of your router, you can see how many devices are on your router. Always one step ahead, parents. One Wasn't step thinking ahead. on that level. So you don't always let them know when you know, by the way. Sometimes you just give them a little line. It's like, zzz, and then you're like, oh, set the hook on that center. Oh, caught one today. Go ahead. And what I quickly learned is that sometimes we're not on the same team. No, we're all on the same not team. Not on the same team. Not on the same team. Did you ever need any shaping? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I definitely needed some shaping. For me, of course, like we already talked about, took a little, uh, little more oomph, I'd say, right? A little drive it hard, drive it a little, little harder home for Titus. Couldn't get it. I just couldn't understand it, you know? Uh, I'll never forget, we were doing homework. I think it was my seventh grade year and doing math, whatever it is, right? And as a middle schooler, I always try to find ways to get out of things. And so I thought if I could ask enough questions like, Dad, why, why am I really doing this homework? Like, how's this, like, this going to help my spiritual walk? Like, should I just, <laughs> should we go study some Bible? Like, I think, I think that'd be better than doing multiplication tables, right? I was like, I was like, why? Why is this important, right? But it, it was never because I was really, like, curious. It's because I just didn't want to do it. And so as we did our homework together that day, uh, Dad always stood over me as I did the homework. He's never sit beside me. He's always stood over me. He's, he's always watching me as I'm going, you know, and I'm starting to feel the pressure a little bit, and I'm filling out the different things. We get to 12 times 12, okay? And I'm like, I can't figure this out. I can't. I cannot do this. I can't do it. I can't. I can look at him. I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it, Dad. Right? And he looks down at me. He says, hey, listen, don't say you can't do it again. I'm like, well, okay. Get back to it, right? Go back down. So I'm filling it out. So I feel, do I carry the one? Do I carry the two? Where does this go? Right? I don't know. Dad, I can't do it. I can't do it. Takes the pencil out of my hand. And he just gives me a nice little <laughs> on the head. Try again. <laughs> Motivated, I was. Figure it out. Guess what? 12 times 12 is 144. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that one right there. But I had to be pushed a little harder. You know, I had to be pushed uh, a little more. But what it really taught me as I looked back uh, now, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to my buddy about this, like the lessons you learn from your parents, right? It's like that little interaction, that little time of math homework in seventh grade, you know, it really instills in you this, almost this resolve to not let what you think you can't do stop you in life, to, 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 to really make this grit in you occur. And as I went forward in life, you know, no, no, no boundary, no, 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 nothing that could be a, a roadblock for my life became too much because of lessons I learned as a kid to not give up when it was too hard to keep going and to keep trying. And so sometimes, you know, a lot of the times these, these pushing your kids and pushing me often taught me lessons that I now can have in my life. Yeah, there's a difference between can't and can. And whenever it comes to education, um, it, when your children, there's, there's not very many that are like, please, can I do some more homework, Dad? Could you just find some more assignments? Now, I know there's some parent in here that's like, well, my angel loves it. I just give them new homework. Oh, but that's just not the average child, okay? And so if you let them bail and, and ask these questions that try to get you off the track, mm -hmm. then they're going to always try to weasel out of more stuff. And you got to get ingrained in their memory that life is not about doing the things that we like to do. Did you guys know that? That most of life, in fact, is doing things that we don't like to do. No one wants to do the dishes. No one is like, more dishes, more laundry, more yard work. No one, no one, no one. And so there is a thing where you have to learn that in these little small battles, they may seem so small, but they are battles that you have to try to fight, parents. And like... He was trying to do the new math. Like, y'all seen this new math, like 700-step math? And I was like, it's 12 times 12. You just know it. You just input it into your brain. 144, all right? That's just what it is. You don't have to know. You don't have to know how it, how it is. It just is, right? 
And so many things in life, I see generations now that are just like, oh, I want to understand it. No! I want you to fill out that form, and I want you to hit send on that email. You don't have to understand how it flies through space and bounces off a satellite and ends up... No! You don't have to understand. Just do. <laughs> just do. How much of your life is wasted? How much of your life is wasted trying to figure out things that you don't have to know because you're trying to get the result? Parents, like you're trying to get the result. Like you don't have to know how God's word works, but you know that it works. And so if you would just apply what his word says, then you're going to get the result that you so deeply desire. You're going to get impact of God change. Was that the only story you had? No, I got one more. You have more? Of being shaped. There's so many stories, but uh, one that sticks out the most um, was a time I also wanted to push the boundary uh, in our house. We were not allowed to have certain applications from the uh, iPhone store, um, such as Snapchat. That was a big no-go. You were why, allowed to have Snapchat at our for the, house. For the people that are older in here that don't know what Snapchat is, why? 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 How could an app be bad, though, really? <laughs> as I said before, it's an application, right? Snapchat is a social media app in which you can send a picture to a friend, and as soon as they open that picture, it disappears forever, Go right? On. And so that was not allowed in our household. Now, what could go wrong with an app that is designed to covertly send photos to people? Parents? Just give that to teenagers. What could, what could go wrong? Well. And it turns out that those photos aren't, they don't, do they actually disappear? Mm. Or can you... Can you screen record a Snapchat? Oh, okay. So parents, you want your kids to have photos of them because they would never send a photo that they shouldn't send. No one in here has ever done that, right? So there's nothing wrong with putting a loaded gun in their hands and then hoping that things don't go wrong, right? Got really quiet. <laughs> Did. So I wanted this app really bad, right? All my friends had it. Um, and what was your logic though? That you it was always, you know, like, it was like, Hey, what's your snap? Right. That's what everybody asked me as a kid. And of course I'm gonna be like, I don't have Snapchat. Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my oh, basketball yeah. team developed this group chat that was only in Snapchat. And so now I was like, this is my way in, right? Like dad, I got to have community with this basketball team. You know, if I really want to, if I want to reach them, you know, yeah, for the Lord, buy them to church, <laughs> like DC, like I got to be in this group chat. It didn't work. Uh, he held the line still. And so finally, I was like, I'm fed up with this, right? I'm tired of this. So I decided to download Snapchat onto my phone and I developed my account. And my username was young.profit. I can't tell you. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you how. This is what it was. And then my name linked to this Snapchat account um, was not Titus Born because that would be stupid, right? Like who would do that if you're trying to hide it? Uh, my middle name's Andrew. And so the name was Tandrew Born, B-O-R-N, instead of B-O-U-R-N-E. will never figure it out. It's genius. He changed his email. I just, you know, just flipped the letters around, you know, and that was it. Oh gosh, anyways. So I have this app now, I'm Snapchatting, I'm adding all my friends and everything. Uh, I'm in like class with my buddy and he's like, you're not supposed to have that. I'm like, yeah, that's true, that's true, but uh, I do. So it's your snap, you know, I can add you. <laughs> so I start out on my friends and stuff and uh, it's great, right? It's glorious, you're living, you're living the life you've always wanted to live. And then you start adding your church friends and your church leaders because they're your friends. And uh, next thing you know, you know, usually these church leaders are knowing what the household holds dear and knowing that we're not supposed to have Snapchat was one of them. So they went and told my parents and I get in trouble for the first time with Snapchat. I got grounded. Yeah, I said first time there. Um, got grounded for know, however long you grounded me for. And that's a whole other story the first time. Uh, the second time though, uh, what happened was the first time I got grounded from my phone when Snapchat happened, uh, I decided I wasn't quite finished yet. You know, I wanted to double down on the dumb. So what I did was is I took Silas's, you know, sweet little Silas. I took his tablet. Um, I just took it. I, that was it. I just stole it. And uh, I downloaded Snapchat on there. My phone's gone, but now I have this 
point of access. And my mom was like, hey, have you seen Silas's tablet around? I'm like, no, you know, that, that little guy probably lost it, you know? <laughs> He's so young, you don't know where he puts things. And so I had this tablet now that I continued my, my run of Snapchat gate. And what happened was I didn't change anything. I didn't change the name, I didn't change the account, I didn't change an email, I didn't even unadd the church leaders. Like, <laughs> it was the same game. And it had the same result. I was like, I look back, I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, how did you not even think to do anything? And so it was about 1 a.m. Uh, on a Friday night, and my dad's the type of guy kind of just stare at you when you're in trouble, you know, and it's like, who just break you with that stare, you know? But uh, this time was different because he abruptly came into my room and turned on the lights. And I was like, oh, this is, this is scary because this is not normal, all right? And I had my tablet under my bed, not mine, Silas's tablet, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I had a tablet under the bed because that's like, you know, it's hidden. And so he flips on the lights and everything. And I act like I'm asleep. I'm like, Dad, what's, what's, ha what's happening? What are, you, what are you doing, man? What's happening? He, all he says, where is it? I was like, Dad, I'm just trying to sleep. I got practice in the morning. What's going on? What are you talking about? Where is it? And at this point, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> then I see in his hand, he's holding this white trash bag. And he walks over to my shoes, which I'm a big I love shoes, I'm a collector of them, right? And he walks over to my shoe rack and just starts picking up pairs and putting them in the trash bag. And he says, where is it? I was like, Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Grabs another pair, puts in, where is it? Father, please, <laughs> please, just let him go, let the shoes go. <laughs> Grabs another one, puts it in, where is it? I was like, fine, fine, you caught me. I go into my bed, I grab the tablet, and I just hold it. I'm like, just take it, please. Take it from me. I don't want it anymore. He sets the trash bag down, takes the tablet. And as he's about to leave, I'm like, well, like, what's my punishment, man? Like, I'm sorry, like, what, what's, what's next? And he's like, I'm going to take a couple days to think about it. I did not sleep a wink that night. <laughs> I'll tell you, that was fear. My whole body, I was so afraid, so afraid. Yeah, I would say, you know, whenever you have a child that is rebelling, you know, you don't always have to decide right then. <laughs> I've learned it's, it's, you know, they're terrorists, all right? And you can't negotiate with terrorists. So you can ask them little questions that are more fun, like, what do you think your punishment should be? And sometimes they go harder than you were actually thinking. I'm like, I agree with you. <laughs> Now they have punished themselves. Do you see this? Do you see the beauty in this? It's like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mind game, but you got to play it. And I'm, I come to play. I'm telling you right now. Yes, and true. one year, uh, it was a Christmas or no. It was, it was a, Christmas. Was it? It was Christmas, man. I had bought a Elite 8 tickets. OU was playing against uh, SMU or something like that. And, uh, you know, whatever he did, guess what? Sold the tickets? Sold them. Sold them. And that was after you been given them as a gift. Why? Got them for Christmas, March Madness, Elite A, OU's first time in Elite A in however many years. Sold those little Sold things. them. And you're like, oh, is it sad for him? Yeah, he learned a lesson, didn't he? I did. He? I did. Everything that our physical possessions are on the table in the born household. And all yeah. those shoes that we were talking about, those aren't shoes that I bought because I'm not going to buy a $200 pair of shoes for anyone. Those are shoes that he bought with his own money that he earned. All right? I'm going to throw away his. Like, you think these are your <laughs> shoes? Watch this. Boom. You're like, you're so mean. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's the point, right? It's not that I'm actually being mean. It's that he's not going to get away with it. Like, if you give them an inch, they will take from you, parents. They'll take from you. You got to fight for that inch. <laughs> right? Does everybody understand? See the bumper? You never quit. Parenting, you never sleep. You picked that out last night to show today. I thought it was, I thought it was solid. Sleep with one eye open is what <laughs> I do. So whenever it comes to all of these shapings, um, would you guys say that uh, you're damaged as a result of <laughs> all of these punishments? No, no, I would not say, I would not use the word damaged. I, I, I think they're ingrained in our memory, but I think that's, that's the point of it. Memories. Uh, you remember oh. both the good 
and the bad. And that same creativity that was used for discipline was also used in fun. And I know we were going to talk some about that today, too. Yeah, we wanted to talk about uh, memory makers. So I think that there's a shortage of creativity in your household. So when it comes to disciplines, if you ever need, like, advice, I've had some parents, like, text me and like, hey, my kid did this. What's a creative discipline? I will do that all day if you need more of that, okay? Like get out scissors and have them go like trim the lawn up with a pair of scissors. Like just get creative. Go crazy with it, right? Mm-hmm. Have them like stack wood over here against this fence and then make them move it over to the other fence. Just keep going, right? Um, you know, there's just endless things that you can do. Uh, but um, it's just like in our household, you're not allowed to say you're bored. What happens when you say you're bored at our house? That boredom is filled with activities very quickly. Very, very quickly. Oh, there's dishes to do. There's yeah. laundry to fold. Oh, got to redo this oh. garage. Yeah. The attic needs to be restacked. Oh, I'm so glad you're bored because I was just thinking Every time. Things that, and then what? after a while, guess what? Your children are never bored. No. Never, not one time. You don't say I'm bored around the born household. You will have but a chore. If you are creative with punishment, you also have to be creative with the positive side, right? And so I see a lot of people when it comes to your your parenting style, I think that this is the most disconnected the family has ever been. Would you guys agree with me by like a head bob? Does anybody like, you ever watch a family go out to eat now? Has anybody seen this? Or like maybe even not even out to eat. You could be just at your house when you're eating. Does everybody just like sit here and like you manage to like scroll and fork and eat and chew all at the same time? It's like vacation it's interesting to me, becomes like a, it's just a transferring the disconnect that's already at your house to another location. So like you're in Hawaii, but you're all just staring at a phone. You're in Florida, you're in San Antonio, wherever you're going to go. And if you're disconnected at your house, is it possible that you're just perpetuating the disconnection? Like you're just paying more for the same ride that you're on every day. Like If you're going to create memories, you have to literally disconnect. You have to disconnect from all of these things in order to create a family time. It doesn't have to be the whole time. It's not like we sit around and like 24 hours a day, we're like, how can we make a memory? And how can we laugh? Or how can I punish people? But there does have to be a moment that you're intentional about. And so many times I think you're leaving memories on the table, parents, because you've left them up to the devices. You gotta, you got to get off the device and have human interaction. Yes. human. Can everybody say amen for that? Amen. Human interaction. And you don't even have to be creative. Google has already done all the work. I promise you, you like type in family games to play while you're on the road. Someone's already like some nerd out there in nerddom land has already like categorized like what kind of games, you know? You like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's like, Find a way to make a memory while you're doing things, whether it's at home, whether it's on the road, whatever it is. And I promise you, we've never gotten back from some place that we've ever been. And they're like, man, that was such a nice place that we stayed. Do you know what they remember? They remember the memories that were made, the fun that was had. Uh, just a couple of garden variety examples that you've experienced just to share with the audience some of the flavor. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that's not even going away from home. We can make memories at all kinds of places. I remember one time we were just sitting around at home for whatever reason, and we decided a memory was going to be made that day. So we went to Stonebriar Mall, and Dad had created the scavenger hunt on a Google Doc, and we took selfies with all kinds of different things to find on the scavenger hunt. I think I was huddled up next to a guy with green hair for a little while just talking about the scavenger hunt. We got a selfie with him, walked away. Uh, We'll also just play little family Olympic games. Like, I think we've got... Um, a clip coming up here soon, but these can be minute to win it games where there's like an Oreo coming down your face or something more creative with maybe chairs set up and a wreath that you got to blow a bubble through and, you know, passion and competition gets, gets pretty high level in our family. Yeah, I think we got a clip. This is, this is a Christmas <laughs> clip. How did it stay? <laughs> How did it oh, oh, That's my it. wife. Oh, there she goes. That's my That's passion. Oh, oh. No this was as close as anyone got. Oh. Go, 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 go. Ah! <laughs> you were so close. Doesn't it just look like it's going to happen? It does. Oh, it, it, does. it doesn't. Oh, I think there was a bottle of wine in that background. <laughs> Someone gave it to me, a church member, I'm sure. Yeah. It's a gift. 
<laughs> we, do make, we do make a lot of memories. Uh, we're always very competitive in the Bourne house. Uh, that is not something that is lacking, I'd say. Uh, you saw that in that video. That's like primetime competition. Right? This is everything, right? And mom is the passionate one. I mean, we're all passionate about winning, but hey, she, she is just right up there with the boys, all right? Uh, but, you know, as, as we are a very competitive family, uh, what happens a lot of the time is that any bet that is put forward, um, any, any outlandish thing that you claim you can do is challenged, all right? And that doesn't stop at the Bourne House. If you're at the Bourne House, or you're just hanging out, whether it's, a, whether it's a staff member or just a friend, whatever it is, like you're hanging out at the Bourne House, you say something, like it's going to get challenged. There will be a bet placed down. And so I'll never forget one night, um, we had done sermon planning or some kind of sermon series planning all night and it had gotten probably one, two, 3 a.m. And now we're just sitting around playing cards. It's me, my dad, uh, Hollis and Nolan. And Hollis is sitting there and he's like, you know what? I think I could kick a 30 yard field goal. <laughs> and my dad looks at him, he's like, dude, no way. Like, there's no way. Like, he's, like, he's like, you can't, but I bet I could kick a 30 yard field goal. So my dad says, so me and Nolan are sitting here like, look at you old bucks squabbling about who could kick. I was like, both of you are broken men. Like his back's already gone. His gallbladder has been removed. I was like, what do you think's gonna happen if we go out here and kick field goals? Like for real. I was like, I could definitely kick one though, of course, right? No one agrees he could kick one. So we go out, all right, it's probably 3 a.m. at this point, mind you. All right, so it's dark. And we go out to Stafford Middle School. All right, we line it up. Hollis goes first kicks that ball right into the ground. I mean, doesn't, I don't think it actually lifted up off the air. It's beautiful. And my dad being the most competitive person I've ever met wants to go last. And so I go next and I kick it in the air, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite get there, you know, and his pride was hurt. Then Nolan goes and Nolan's same thing as me. He doesn't quite get there. And then dad steps up, all right? And he has like this whole like routine I've never seen. I'm like, what is happening? And he winds up, launches that sucker, all right? 30 yards right through the uprights. Yeah, give it up for him. But I'm sitting there, I'm like, are you hustling us? Like, did you kick, you kick field goals? You be honest. He takes it back another 10 yards, kicks a 40 and makes it. And I'm like, what is going on right now? Am I being punked? Is there cameras somewhere around here? Like, what's happening? But I'll never forget that. You know, 3 a.m. kicking field goals with your hobbled father and a couple buddies. You know, all for, all for nothing. There's nothing on the line, just, just for pure Pride. fun. Pride. Pride. Pride was on the line. Pride. Pride was on the line. Yeah, I think that uh, parents, we have a lot of games. We have Family Olympics. Uh, we have, what else do we have? Scavenger hunts. Uh, we have one called the Goodwill Games. Um, so, see, parents, like, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, but you can go to your local like thrift store and everybody has to buy an outfit. We give them a budget. And I will tell you some of the craziest outfits I've ever, like we couldn't even show some of the pictures. <laughs> that didn't make it up there first service. Oh boy. Oh, wow. I think that was going to come out today. <laughs> I didn't know we were throwing that up there today. Okay. Hey. Let's take it off. <laughs> Let's take it off. We're good. We can stop. Oh, man. That was not in the script. Nope. I am not comfortable right now. right now. Moving on. My wife thinks she's really funny right now. Where is she? Uh, she's like, put it up there. It'll be funny. <laughs> so anyway, a lot of fun things happen. Oh, boy. On vacation. And so... Uh, we just try to create as many memories as we can as we go along. And uh, I was not raised that way. Um, I never went on, uh, we went on maybe one, one family trip ever. And we would just go and it was like, you know, uh, sit around, do whatever. But we didn't interact. And parents, you only have this little small window of time. And going out and kicking a field goal at 3 a.m. seems like a dumb thing. But it's a memory. You know, one time Jordan said, people started betting whether or not, like how much would it take to jump in the pond when it was 20 degrees outside? And it turned out for 20 bucks, Jordan. Well, I got 20 bucks from two different people, so it was 40 bucks. Oh, 40 bucks. So, you know, but there's constantly opportunities all around you to create these memories. And I'm telling you, when they get older, that's what they're going to take with them. They're not going to take that you... You went to Hawaii or some exotic place. 
but you didn't do anything to create a memory to, to bond the family together. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, parents, be, if you're the father leading the household, lead in creativity, you know, do the homework so that your kids can have these memories because they're going to make them with someone. And if it's not with you, it's probably going to be their jack wagon friends. And it's probably not going to be godly. It's probably going to be something ungodly. And I just want them to know that we can have fun as Christians. Since Carrie did that to me, I have a story, okay? <laughs> I was asking Silas this week. I was like, hey, son. We're so far off the map. Oh, we're right off now. now. I don't know. Where oh, this is, this is going to be fun now for me. So I was like, Silas, um, what's some of your favorite memories, okay? And without hesitation, this was right off like the top. Of, this is several years ago, probably three years ago. He's eighth grader. Um, so we were, I think, at Christmas or Thanksgiving. I think it was Thanksgiving. And we did, somebody had smuggled in a bottle of red wine and poured it in a glass when we weren't in the house. And, um, and so I was drinking this uh, glass of wine. Carrie had a glass of wine down there. And Carrie's like, I got to use the bathroom. And so, so while she was out of the room, I poured her glass in my glass. And when she came back out, I told Silas, I was like, dude, you tip it up, okay? Tip it up. And so he tips up this empty glass as she's walking out. I'm like, Silas, what are you doing? The look on her eyes, right? She's like, Silas, you put that. And so I like, grabbed it. Like, I thought she was going to ninja chop him, I swear. I like, and he's like kind of like hovering, but now he's smiling anyway. The boys were laughing hysterically, maniacally, and a memory, see, was made. <laughs> memory was made. That's the way you do it. Yeah. Memory makers. Yeah. Memory makers. Yeah. Revenge. Revenge. So anyway, um, last segment that we'll cover are, you know, parents, as you're thinking about your children, and especially if we have blended families in here, this is really good um, for you, is that I think that everybody in the household has to be on the same page as to what the rules are. So we're going to call these non-negotiables, okay? Non-negotiables. And what I found is that when you're bringing your family into it, let's say that you were raised like I was. I was raised, you know, no God, no, no, I mean, like no real boundaries, I would say. Um, and um, curfew, very laissez-faire. Uh, and my wife was raised in a very Christian household. So what I found is that when you get married, if you haven't discussed these things, like it's like a ticking time bomb that's just below the surface. Because when you're married with no kids, it's like, oh, you know, you do kind of you and I'll do me. But like when that little human comes into the planet and now it's like, oh, are we going to do this the born way or are we going to do this the Harper way? Well, now why is your way better than their way? I have a solution for you. It's called an arbitrary third party that is impartial to your way or their way. And it's called the Bible. Okay? Did you know the Bible is not for you and against them, against them, for you? The Bible is for God, and God's way is the best way. Train up a child in the way that should go. When they're old, they'll not depart from it. I would just really encourage you that every premarital that I do with a blended family, I say, you guys got to come up with like your Ten Commandments. Like these are the Holy of Holies. And you, everybody has to agree what the rules are. Because you can't have one set of rules for your kids and one set of rules for their kids, right? And so in a regular household that doesn't, isn't blended, even mom and dad, you got to be on the same page. If little Johnny is going to stick the fork in the outlet, can he get a slap on the hand? Does he get a rap on the hand? What does he get? But we can't be like mom has one set of discipline, dad has another set of discipline, and it can't be dads. I see some dads that... They're like sitting on the sidelines letting mom be the, the law. And they just are content for mom to like do it. And I'm like, hey, if you're going to lead, then you got to jump in there. And if kids are ever disrespecting mom and you just let that slide, what would happen, do you suppose, to you? If you ever looked at your mom and was like, shut up. Oh, I can't even imagine. Like, dude, you probably wouldn't remember what happened. <laughs> like... If they disrespect the mom, what do you think is going to happen when they get married? They're going to carry that disrespect, right? Pack that bag, take it with them into the next relationship. Respect, non-negotiable, go. Yeah, another non-negotiable we always had um, was just showing up. 
And so on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or whatever event it is, you're going to be there if we're having church. And there's, there's no room for the, well, he didn't feel like coming today. She didn't. I mean, every week that you're in here, that your kids are in here, there's an opportunity for God to give them exactly what they need. And what if on the one day that sleeping in was allowed, that maybe they went to a friend's, blah, blah, blah. What if that was the day that God had what they needed and they missed it? We just can't, we can't take those risks. And so being here was always a non-negotiable. Do you have any non-negotiables? Yeah, another one that we had was uh, knowing that all of our actions not only affected us, but affected others. And so the perspective was always given to us from a young age, like, hey, you see how this action affects this and this and this, and always talking through that, you know, what you're doing doesn't stop at you. And uh, there's a great story that we're going to share a little bit later about me and Jordan being tied together in a punishment. Um, but what, what really happens is that once you learn that as a, as a young kid, as a seventh, eighth grader, as a high schooler even, you know, you start to think about your actions on a, on a bigger level than just the now. And I think in life, we have to, you have to think about like a student thinks about things happening right now, right? Everything is right now. And so giving that perspective to us was always non-negotiable to know, okay, my actions have consequences. And those consequences don't just affect me, but also affect others. And so that was always talked about a lot, a lot in our house. Yeah. There's a lot of non-negotiables. Parents, you should know what yours are, and they should be rooted in truth, right? If God's word says that we need to do this, then that's what we do as a family. And if you teach your kids that, then wouldn't it be great if they could just take those foundational stones that are never going to change. It won't matter. The great thing about the Bible is that it can exist in a vacuum because it's absolute in its authority that 10 years from now, that truth that you taught them, it won't be different because it's tied to God's truth. It, you know, 20 years from now, a generation from now, that truth does not change. And so if you were to build your family's values based upon if you're above 30, how you were raised, 60, how you were raised, whatever the culture was that day, do you think that the culture has changed any? Do you think that that standard would have changed? Absolutely. Wouldn't it be better to build it on a timeless truth? And so as we were discussing negotiables, there's one last story that we'd like to share with you guys. And it's become known as 180 days. 180 days. Oh, boy. The infamous time. Yeah. We had got in trouble however many times throughout the calendar year. And we got around to this one summer. And it was decided that me and Dark Titus summer. Dark needed, summer. needed the ante to be upped in order yes. to get whatever lesson to sink through. We had so to learn. We were given a joint punishment grounding together. We shared this 180-day sentence right there. where we lost phones, we lost social activities, yep. we lost our beds, yeah. we were sleeping under the pool table. It was just like freedom. This, like, no room, okay? Like bedroom, bed, gone, okay? We had to share the space under the pool table. So whatever rectangular shape that is, is what we had. We had one blanket and one pillow to share, all right? Titus is not a cuddler. I tried. I'm not, not at all. And I'm a sophomore in high school. He's a senior in high school. So imagine, yeah, yeah. Imagine that problem that Memories arose. Were made. Oh, you're so mean to them. 180 <laughs> days, <laughs> became like a currency. It, it did. Days could be earned, days could be taken, days could be given. Yeah. We were just leased out to church members. Oh, do you need your lawn mowed this weekend? My boys will earn a few days from me if you just let them go out. No money, not paid, okay? Days. We got days back. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about this for a second. All right. I don't pay my kids to do their jobs around the house. Just so you know, like parents, I don't know if someone taught you that along the way. And I'm not saying if you give them allowance that you're wrong for doing that. I'm just saying you don't have to pay them anything. They get to live there. Yeah, that's your payment. Like, did you eat food today? There you go. Did you have clothes you wore today? Yeah. Do you like that? All right. Now, when I tell you to go over there and do that, guess what you do? You do it. Because I said so. Because I'm the dad. Does everybody understand? Everybody say amen. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to pay them nothing. You go home today. You say, you're going to go out and take the lawn. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And you don't get anything but a smile. Well done. Pat them on the back. That's what you get. Because yeah. when they get out there in the real world, yeah. guess what? If they're paycheck players at your house, they'll be paycheck players out there. You don't do it because you get paid to do it. You do it because you love to do it, right? Come on. Soapbox. There you go. That was good. That was out. good. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Don't hurt yourself now. Whew. I mean, they're, they were. Don't have that gallbladder anymore, remember. Yeah. 
So, calm down. There were all kinds of creative Kick a field goal when we get done. Yeah, hey, we'll go. I'll bet you those shoes. Father's Day. No, no, no. But as PKs, people knew our punishments. I mean, it wasn't like a secret, all right? It was actually a game he got to play. So, hey, so like, like you said, the boys have 180 days of grounding. So, if you have anything, anything they can do around your house, you just ask. You just ask. And that's what we did for a whole summer. And, and then you some. Know, you never forget that. Right. Nope. And so that's that's uh, I think the point, whether it's the, the fun side of things, whether it's the discipline side of things is the memory of it is what makes the lesson yep. stick. And yep. what we learned, or at least what I learned over time, I think you could say the same, is that really that's born out of love. And we looked at a couple verses in Hebrews um, chapter 12, verse six says the uh, the Lord disciplines the one that he loves. And me and dad were talking about this at Fuse Camp. Um, I used to look at all my friends, and I felt like they were trying to, the ones that, that didn't have fathers, and sometimes it was just a father without the mother, but most of the time, my buddies growing up, if it was a single-parent household, dad was gone. They were trying to overcome this love deficit that was in their lives. And what I realized, I think, at this most recent camp we were at is that I'm seeing a love deficit even in kids that I know have mom and dad, and so maybe we have a problem not only on the battlefront against the father who's not present, but now maybe we have a battle on the father who's there, but he's passive. And whether or not it's intentional, there's a love deficit that is now in somebody who's not been disciplined. And we've seen through you that the, that is always not out of anger or out of, I'm trying to get on to you guys, but you're trying to teach us stuff. And, and I think back to my days, whenever I was coming up in Fuse and I had more than just your voice in my life telling me what the right way was. I had, you know, other staff guys in my corner and really a lot of fuse leaders in my corner. And I don't know where I'd be today if I didn't have those strong men in my life that are, that are pointing me to where I was going. I don't know if I'd have the same opportunities to sing up here on this stage in front of you all. And, you know, if, if I needed that back then and we have however many more of me now, I think we're always going to need more men who are going to be present, who are going to be unpassive and are going to be holding the line and so I think that's really important yeah I call it um, a plurality of voices in their lives mm -hmm. um, parents every parent will realize this when your child becomes a teenager um, they think of you as oh that's just dad that's just mom has anybody ever been told this right kind of bob your head like oh okay mom you know but let someone else say the exact same thing and that person is a genius and all your credit just gets taken away right and they're like come home and they start telling you something that someone else said that you've told them a hundred times and it's like they just discovered plutonium right and and you're just like okay yeah that's great I'm glad you learned that but anyway um, what we did was like whenever my kids would struggle um, we had godly men elders other student uh, leaders and you know, we would share those struggles that our kids were having with those leaders. And now we're not telling all their deepest, darkest secrets, but we're giving them a heads up because we want them to be able to have a safe place that echoes, because we're playing from the same playbook, the godly values, because now it's not just dad that's saying it. It's Ben, it's Hollis, it's other student leaders that are in their lives, and we're all singing the same song. It becomes a much more powerful chorus when they start to realize that there are lots of people that have the same value and it drills it home and it makes it more bedrock in their lives. So why do you need to have other godly leadership? Why do you need to have Christian community? Why do your kids need to show up when we have youth services and things like that? Because it creates a plurality of godly voices in their lives. You had one last thing to wrap us up? Yeah, and uh, in Hebrews 12, 11, continue what Jordan was talking about. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. You know, I think as a kid, obviously, we don't like the discipline being put on us at the time, right? We're not like, thank you, Dad. Thank you for the grounding. No. Never. No, never. It's always met with, you know, anger or upset upsetness and so you're, you're you're battling the front of your kid being upset right 
But I think a lot of the times it's not just painful for the kid being punished, but it also can be painful for the parent, right? It can be hard to discipline your kid, to hold that line uh, in life, you know, because you don't want to yell at them, you don't want to punish them. But if they need that, then you have to give them that. And so I think whatever, like, barriers that you have in your parenting when it comes to pushing past that line of disciplining, of coming down hard on them when they need it, like, you need to push past that. You got to push past that. It might be painful, it might be hard. It's not pleasant at the time, but it's going to be worth it in the end. It really will, because I'll tell you, like, we need it. I, I needed it as a kid. I needed that because if I wasn't, you know, pushed the way I was, I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think I would be on this stage. I don't think I would be here. You know, I think I would have split after high school and gone. But because I had parenting, because I had discipline in my life, I learned valuable lessons that stuck with me, that will always stick with me. And so knowing that as a parent, you have to have different perspective than your student. Because like I said earlier, your student's gonna, gonna always think in terms of right now, what's going on. And you as a parent can't think about right now. You have to think about what's, what, what later looks like, what the future looks like for them. What are you ingraining in them right now that's going to follow them into their, to their adult lives? What bad habits are you reinforcing? What good habits are you reinforcing? And so knowing that you have to know that the harvest is coming, mm. that, that it's coming, and what they produce, what they become, is now on the, on, the onus is on you and how you go about the foundation of your household being on the word of God or the word of what you think. And so knowing that the, the, the production is coming, the harvest is coming in your, in your life with these kids. Yeah. I think that the moral of the story is that when they get from sixth grade to 12th grade, it's essentially seven years. And are you willing to trade seven years for the rest of their lives? That if you hold the line for seven years, and it's a marathon, parents, but if you hold the line for that seven years, then they get to love you for it for the rest of their lives. And now it's kind of cool, full circle moment. We're on the same team again. We're on the same team again, right? And Yay. how cool is that? So I hope today that you understand we're not trying to say the borns have got it all figured out, <laughs> that we are perfect or that, that uh, these are angel babies and never do anything wrong now or that as a father, I always got it right. But I do think that we can say that because we were consistent and because we towed the line that their hearts are for God, they're towards God. And Jordan got to carry that with him into his marriage. Do you think how you were parented affected who you picked? Probably so. Yeah. And he has a godly marriage with a godly woman. Don't you wish someone would have given you that when you were a young person? For those of you that didn't know that and you just picked someone randomly and paid for it, I hope that you'd understand that there's a lot of things that they're not going to like. And your goal is not for them to like it. Your goal is for you to love them. Love them. Hold the line. And then someday your reward is hopefully 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 30. And like, Dad, thank you. Mom, thank you. And then you get to, if you didn't have it right for your household, here's the proof. Here's the proof. Never had any God. Now I have my sons. They love God. Don't you think? It's possible for you to turn it around for the sake of your family. What's it going to take? Consistency, commitment. You can't be haphazard in your consistency and then tell them, love the God that you didn't show them. You show up. You have non-negotiables for God. If it means taking less money to have more God, take less money. If it means moving to somewhere else because something happened, you've got to rebuild your family, protect the family at all costs. Whatever it takes, show them that. And I promise you, that jack wagon, one day, one day, they'll see the light. And we saw 82 of them, at least for a moment. They were like, Give it up. there's something there that I want. Yeah. There's something there that I need. They've already got all the other stuff. And you'll see that the arguments all centered around what? Technology. Technology. Guard the gate. Guard the gate. You're like, well, it's just YouTube. No, you, there's almost nothing that's not on YouTube. Why would you let them have YouTube? Like, that's terrible. You can't let them have YouTube. You can't even have them have YouTube. Instagram. Like, do they need it? Do they really need it? Like, hmm, 
Like, do you have access to it? Do they have passwords that you don't know? Hmm. Why would, there, why would there be something that you don't need to know? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, they'll get to an age where they can have that freedom. That time is not now. You're like, this is my space, Mom. Give me my space. No, I'll not give you your space. You will take that space and you'll do stupid things. And therefore, I have to guard against that. Like, it's just, it's just a party. Like, what's going to happen? I'm not going to do anything dumb. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Just give you enough times and you will do something dumb. And so it's not that you can protect them again from everything. But if I guard the gate hard enough, then it allows that their, their margin is lower for what those things will be. Yeah. And now I want to live in that margin. I want to live in the margin where my worst thing was that he found a phone that he was able to text on for a little while. Don't you, wouldn't you want that to be the worst thing that you ever had to parent through? That... Old Titus, oh, I'm not going to say it. But anyway, you know, different things. But, like, those are marginal compared to someone gets involved on a sexual level and makes mistakes that they have to pay for for the rest of their lives because I let them just do whatever they want, date whoever they want. See what I'm saying? Parents, your job is to guard their hearts. Guard it. And I think if you love them like that, they'll appreciate it for the rest of their life. All right? Let's end this with prayer. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you help us all, God, to be the parents that you called us to be, that we use your word as the guidebook, and that we always, always defer to you uh, for how we raise our children. And God, that we might even raise up more leaders who want to invest in the next generation through our children's ministry and student ministry. Uh, God, we need more godly men in this world, certainly not less. And so God, help us all to be the examples that we need to be. We ask these things in your name. And the church said, amen. All right. We're going to